North Stream chose this site because it is the perfect nexus for oil sands petroleum into the U.S. God damn it, you just rolled in here. You weren't born here, you weren't raised here. I thought people loved the police in Canada. Yeah, until you got here, evidently. You may well have a personal opinion about our use of the road, but you're powerless to stop it. You say that, that won't we? Just get here, Chief. Quick. Just want to look around. You need a reason. Murder investigation. You seriously think an oil company killed him? Yeah. A Canadian oil company? Yeah, I do. Your only hope is to cooperate fully with Nord Stream Oil. You're asking me to destroy this man's family. That! Tim Roth, thanks so much for being here. Good. I just... What, oh, what's going on? I, um, oh, it's the most, oh, that's the most I've seen of it. Because you don't watch yourself. No. Which I, I find interesting that people get very surprised when they talk to you, that they say, I can't believe you, I wouldn't watch my, I mean, it's impossible. Not unless you're forced to. Right. Like, um, like, if I'm at a film festival or something like that, and then I'm, you're, like, it's, like it sounds fancy pants bullshit, but it's true. <laughs> like, if you're, if you're brought in and then they go, can you, can you hear me? Yeah. So, you're stuck in the row of your own screening, and then you can't get out without looking like a wanker, basically. So what was the last film of yours that you saw? The last one, I'm trying to think. I think uh, the last one that I saw, I think it was Grace of Monaco, which was only because of being stuck. <laughs> I couldn't get out and I cringed all the way through it and my wife was sitting next to me and she's like, oh, for God's sake, you know. <laughs> so there's that. You do this for a living. No, no. <laughs> she thinks that every time she moves, it's a, it's a critic. She's, she's, you know, that I'm reading, so I read stuff into it and oh. she's just got an itch, you know. It's kind of, do you do that though? I'm, I, I just, it's not worth me watching myself. I know what I look like. It's fine. At what point in your career did you realize that? I, when I directed was when I stopped. So I did about 15 years ago, I directed a one film. So an am it's an amazing film. I rewatched it Thanks. recently. It's, it's a beautiful, heartbreaking yeah. film. Uh, hopefully I'll do another one. But um, that was when I stopped actually watching uh, myself in anything. I was, just, I was doing too much of this, talking about myself, which is, you know, kind of the worst thing you can do. I mean, I'm not saying your job is, no, 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 just I, I, listening I, I, to me talk about myself is just, you just don't want to go down that road. So anyway, um, I stopped and I stopped and it was actually great because my job, my job is over by the time they take over and start to edit. So I actually, that's why it's kind of interesting watching that. I don't know how they cut it together. No idea. I don't know how it will look for you guys, um, but it's all for you now. It's got nothing to do with me. But that's, I, would, I, would, I would argue that's- It's like, true though. That's, it's, that's slightly unfortunate when it comes to this project because this project is so twisted and wild and fun. I've seen five episodes, I told you, and it's, there's nothing else like it on TV. It's so cool. And it's dark. It's bonkers. It's, oh, sorry, it's bonkers. And there's so many actors doing incredible work in it who also aren't in scenes with you as well. I know. I had no control over them. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but, um, but yeah, we had new actors. Like, there's new people. Um, the girl who plays my daughter, who I love. Uh, I think it was her, like a third job or something, second, third job. Then the, 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 without doing the spoiler thing, but the guy mm -hmm. in that, again, brand new. Um, the young guy. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, we, you're at episode five, right? Four. End of four, I believe, yeah. I have no idea. So uh, <laughs> it's going to get weird. It, it kind of starts weird, I remember from the scripts. We improvised a lot of it. Anyways. Yeah, I, I heard you say that. You interview, you improvise an entire episode, which is seemingly I impossible for a thriller series, because there's so many beats that you have to hit. Well, it wasn't, the, it wasn't, it was, it was, the script was delivered, and, and Rowan was up for it. He, 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 the guy who created the show, he'd seen what we were doing, and we'd been improvising throughout, the, the series, series, and the family dynamic was was he loved, mm -hmm. so he kind of went, go for it, go for it, go on, let's see what you got. When was the last time you had the chance to do something like that? To improvise a television? To improvise in yeah. long form? Uh, only since Mike Lee. 
But you do, um, you improvise in films, things happen. Right. Um, but the Mike Lee one, which we were talking about earlier, um, was a, there was no script at all. That was, uh, you div it's, he calls devised by Mike Lee. Right. Uh, he did at one point say written by, and he, all his actors got pissed off with him. Well, yeah, he changed it to written by around we like, 1990. Were, yeah, I think around Naked. Yeah, I think around Naked for yeah. awards. Nobody <laughs> was really buying that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's phenomenal process. But no, so you don't don't get to improvise on telly because it's a big business and they're scared. You know, they're scared of you doing that. But if you sh the the mob who did this were once they started seeing what we were doing, the you know, I mean the money guys, they were going, Ah, you're all right, don't worry about it. Right. And then they picked it up again to do another one. So, so you're gonna do another season, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I kinda I can't wait to get to the end of this season. It's nuts. Yeah. You uh you, you have an incredible variety of, of parts that you've taken over the course of the you know, your career. And I think in the last ten or fifteen years you've said that you had to put your kids to college, so you've taken the great roles and you've also taken roles for, for Well shit, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to name the shit at I all. I could. Well, actually, you probably could. Um, I've never seen him. Um, so <laughs> you have no idea. If it might be brilliant. Um, no, you have to do that stuff. The problem with the... the it, it, it's the school, the school system is bollocks here. Yeah. And so the healthcare system. And so is the healthcare system. And, and so I'm not having my kids come out of school with a mortgage. And I have a chance to do something about it, so I just fucking do it. You know, don't um, don't give them that. What what the, what kind of legacy is that as, a, as for a child? And it should not be allowed. And it's happening in Britain now as well. The student loan thing and all of that. It's like such a scam. It's such a con. So I'm just not having it. So you got to take really bad movies, in that case. And so I did. And yeah. Why not sacrifice a little bit of time for that? For and the, dignity. It's not that hard. <laughs> How much, di how much dignity was dignity. it? Dignity. I always say it's like you've got a bucket, right? Like a really, like one of those dodgy, um, what do you say, aluminum buckets, right? And it's by the door, and it's knackered. It's got a, like, it's got a, a hole in it, and there's been a mop standing in it, in it for a while. And you leave a little bit of your soul in it as you leave the set every day. <laughs> <laughs> Just drips away and goes in the leaks. That's kind of it. There's a, it's heartbreaking when you... But there's something rather wonderful about, all right, I've got to go off to location, leave my family, do something I don't want to do. I think that's all right. I think most people have that in their lives anyway. I'm just absolutely bloody lucky that this is my gig. You're doing something for a greater purpose it outside of yourself. It doesn't matter. It's a better job than going down a mine. Yeah. You know, it's, hopefully you entertain the miners is the idea. But at the same time, while doing some of these projects, you still got to do some really great projects as well. You know, you still got to work with some fantastic directors over the last yeah. couple of decades, and you had your own show on Fox, which you ended up loving. That you, uh, yeah, you know. I, I, I wanted to be killed off in the pilot, <laughs> in in that one. I actually suggested it. I said, "Lie to me." I said, I, "I think right. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think this is a really good idea." And they they looked at me like I was insane. Right. But I figured it wasn't going to get picked up anyway, so it should be a pilot. So let's just kill him off. You and left the room and the guys were like, Tim, what's going to kill him off? It's just, oh God, what have we got ourselves into? Yeah. It was probably what they were saying. That's true. And I actually liked it by the end of it. There was, a, there was a young writer that came in on the second season and things started to change. And then he's quite a famous fella now. But, um, but he was a st like staff writer, the guy that sort of goes for the tea type of thing, but he was really, really good. And I, by the end of it, I had him up, he was showrunner by the end of it. He was brilliant, this guy. And Can he I is, ask his name? Who his is name is Alex Carey. Alex Carey, what does he work, what does he have to? You'll find out. Oh, okay. So he's yet <laughs> no, no, to be he's, famous. He's, no, he's up and running, he's brilliant. But he, he was just this guy with really good ideas. And what happens is when you do one of those TV shows, you go in a room and it's full of writers and they pitch you their ideas for episodes and you just go oh god and your, 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 your eyeballs are melting and then there's a good voice in the room and you go well who's that that I know, everything that he said all of that and that's when the character started getting interesting for me to play because he was writing character he wasn't writing plot so. now were you looking for another TV show when Tin Star came up or did just a good script come and you decided to jump on it no I I, I I'm not averse to anything. I think of I think 
my whole sort of career, if you like, is a is a mad experiment, and and I so I wasn't it wasn't I wasn't I wasn't thinking about it. I know the work that goes into doing a telly. It's hard, it's slog, and also your the risk of failure is huge. But so what? And then uh, I, I started reading it, and you've seen a bit of it. I saw I read the first episode, and it wasn't as it. Obviously, because we improvised a lot and played, but it was there. And then what happened at the end of the first episode, I went, oh, my God. And I just thought, that's a bold move. Yeah. I'll have a little journey down this road then. It's exactly what executives yeah. tell you not to do you're in not TV supposed shows to do and that. movies. No, yeah. You're not supposed it's like to do number that. one or two rule, like, do not do this. Don't, do, don't be doing that. No, that's no. Whoa. And they went, yeah. And the show kind of consistently does that as it as it moves forward. It yeah. seems like uh, it, it exists it, for the purpose of breaking a lot of those rules. I think it's I think it's quite naughty in that respect. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I do. I think I think I mean it, it's definitely going. There's no going to be. There's not going to be any kind of middle ground. You'll either hate it or you'll love it. But it won't be any kind of grey area. I don't think it is. I mean, from what I know of it. From being in it, it's quite out there, and it and it it builds, it absolutely builds. So like you're at four, nothing. I like it's from what you know of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another project that you uh, you were in this year, uh, incredible, was uh, the Twin Peaks return. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, with Jennifer Haven't Jason Leigh. Yeah. Are you gonna watch that? I am gonna watch that. Yeah, you gotta because, watch that. But I'm not allowed to watch it until I've got to do one of my sons, my middle one. He wants to see the first Twin Peaks, which was made before he was born. And he wants to go all the way up and through, in, including the movie wow. and the central piece, and then we'll watch it. So we're going to try and find a time to do that together. And so, so then I will actually, I'll probably close my eyes when I come on, but, um, but I, uh, we'll do it together, hopefully. What was it like working with uh, David Lynch? Um, really easy. I mean, he's so happy you've showed up. <laughs> he, it, it, he is, though. He's like, thanks for coming. You know, and he's, a, he's this... <laughs> it's true. There you go. Really? You're David Lynch? It's David Lynch over there. Um, so you kind of... Once you get over that, um, you get into it. He's, his notes to me were very unusual. I've heard that, yeah. Yeah, and I liked them. Like, I, I mean, one of the notes, you've seen it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, but you, this is spoiler alert stuff, so don't, so, but one, one, of, one of his notes to me, one of the bits that I was involved in, and you'll know what I'm talking about, probably, is he said, think Elvis ragdoll, and we shall it. <laughs> <laughs> and it made complete sense to me. I've heard that some of his notes sometimes are also speak slow. And he'll do it on the bullhorn. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's amazing. Oops, he's, he's just one of those incredible humans. Is that one of those things that, uh, you know, David Lynch calls you and you just sort of jump at You just thing? go, yes. You don't even know why. You just go, yep, uh-huh. Who else do you do Quentin. that with? Quentin? <laughs> Quentin, definitely. Had you even heard, read a script for that Hateful Eight when he approached you, or were you just like, yeah, let me go? No, it goes like this, which and I, you have to understand, he's one of the people I love. I mean, he just changed my life, basically, for the, for the best. Um, the phone rings. You just go, please, 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 please. And then he pick out, goes, Tim, why don't you read something? And you're like, OK, that, now that can go two ways because you could be reading something you're not in, and then you'll be crestfallen. But he writes such beautiful music, so you just go for it. But if he says, I've got something for you, it's again, you don't, you just go. Where, when do you need me? Where do you need me? What, you know, you're just one of those people, you just show up. And, and any actor would, would respond in that way. Um, what was it like, uh, you know, you, you'd work with great, great writers and great directors and great divisors before Reservoir Dogs. Uh, what was it like getting the chance to do the commode monologue? Because that monologue still reverberates in my brain. It's a beautiful piece of writing, you know? <laughs> commode. Well, the best bit about it, well, first of all, it's great. Yeah. 
you know, um, it's all that whole sequence, and it was it was as scripted, and it was, oh yeah, and it's stage directed. Like he's he really knows this. You know, it's a it's a great director at work before you've even met the guy. It, 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 it's un, unlike anything that you'll come across. And the other actor close, in the scene is Close would be like too. Tom Stoppard. Would be someone like Tom Stoppard. Would be pretty. I would put them in the same bracket, uh, writing wise. Um, but uh, it, no, it was great. The, the, you know the bit. I don't know if it's the same. If it's still the commode. Yeah. So then you see me in the loo, right, mm -hmm. in the toilet, and the camera's going around like this, and I'm talking, and the cops are there, yeah, yeah. and the dogs are right. So what happened was we were shooting it, and, and we, you know, we had no money or anything, so we'd sent the sound guys home. We weren't gonna, that was going to be a voiceover. It was not going to be actually me talking in it. So he said, we put the camera up, he said, can you time it for me? So I just started saying that, that part of the speech, and, and we both of us looked at each other and went, oh, shit. And, we had to, and it was before cell phones were really going on. We had to, I think it was pages. We managed to find the guys, the sound guys, and get them back to them. We shot it that way. But it was only because we were timing it for camera. Because it's a 360 track. I'm going around. When you get a, a piece of writing like that, you know, how often do you get, a, do you get a, a, a monologue like that in movies? I think, he, I th I think it's only him. I th I th it's something that we've talked about, and all of us talk about it as actors when we were working together. When we were doing Hateful Eight, it was the same. Um, that you just don't get that. You don't get given playtime like that in film. You just don't. Because well, no one can really write that way on film. I mean, it's impossible to sustain a scene over the course of a... a to use a monologue to sustain a scene. Well, I mean... It's uh, almost impossible. He, and so that's why he'll, he'll just... Do it, so, <laughs> just to wind you up. You, uh, you, you no, also it well, for better reasons than that. But you also well. work with uh, Werner Herzog yeah. in one of his, I think, uh, better later later films. What was it like working with Werner Herzog? You've worked with really like all my favorite that, directors, so I'm just going down the list right now. Werner would come by the house, right? He'd come over to my house, and my kids were little, and he'd go, "Tim, I come." I said, "Well, the kids are about." He said, oh, "Children love me." <laughs> Fuck me. Man, he would come, and, hello, like this, and they would run screaming from him. <laughs> it's it was like, terrifying. I just thought he was, well, first of all, Casper Hauser is, <laughs> it's true, no, he's scared of kids. Okay, get that man away from my children. Yes, my wife. get your kids over yeah, here. Yes, come on, little boys. <laughs> and, um, you know, I love him though. Um, so, so, yeah, so what was it like working with him? Kind of crazy. I mean, I did say to him, I don't want to be your um, Klaus Kinski. I'm not <laughs> wanting that in my life. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're like, I want to show up and do the job. <laughs> like, do I'm happy to come and be part of your circus. <laughs> but we, had, we got on like, a house on fire. I wouldn't let him hypnotize me. You wanted to hypnotize you? No, I was taught to hypnotize people, oh. which I could do. I, I, was, I did do. The problem is bringing them back. <laughs> 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 There was one, there was this girl that I had to hypnotize in that movie, and, and after a while, we did like three or four takes, getting her back, it was tricky. Really? She, it was so much nicer where she was going. <laughs> so I've said, you know, you, you've only directed uh, one film, mm -hmm. like, which is, uh, that film alone as a debut film, or as any kind of film, is a pretty staggering achievement of a movie, and you haven't directed since. No, I did, um, I, I, I did it, and I actually would prefer to just do that. I'd be happy not, really? not to act. Yeah, 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 yeah. Happy yeah. to direct, just not direct. just happy to do that film. Oh, no, okay, just, yeah. to, just be that. But, it, you know, for the films that I want to make, they don't pay you yeah. um, on that one. And I've got the kids to organize. I've got, I got one left. I've got two more years of college fees. And I don't get a job. Um, uh, <laughs> And then, I'll, actually, my plan is to be looked after. I want to be a kept parent. Um, so that's my plan. And then I'm going to go back and have, a, have another go. I'm going to, and I have, I have two things that are scripted, but I am looking at a third, and then I want to be open to whatever comes my way that I don't know about, that kind of thing. So in a couple of years, I'll be ready. Are the works in the in a similar vein as uh, the war zone, tonally or uh, emotionally? 
Uh, one, one is, one is in, the, in the same area. Yeah. It's about social worker. Um, the other is King Lear, mm -hmm. um, which Pinter adapted for me to do. When was that? Yeah. <laughs> After, uh, <laughs> oh God, that's a good story, isn't it? Yeah. I, well, if you like Pinter, it is. Um, I was on, on the set of The War Zone, and we were talking, all of us were talking about um, what, what should I do next, you know, if, if I was going to direct another f film. And I said, I'd like to do something that revolves around a family. And Ray went, you should do King Lear. And I went, and it was like a penny dropped. I thought, my God, because if you take it away from what, from the royalty aspect of it, it's a very interesting sort of family dynamic. And I'm not, I'm, I'm, that's not how I'm planning to do it. But anyway, so I thought, oh, that's a good idea. So the first call I made was to Tom Stoppard because I'd worked with him. He went, I'm not your man. I was like, oh. He said, but I know who is. You should talk to Harold. He's always wanted to do this. And the next thing I know, I'm. The phone's ringing and it's Harold Pinter. And he said, I got it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, on it. Okay, first draft in three weeks. Wow. He said, I've been wanting to do this all my life. I've wanted to do this first draft. But in typical Pinter form, no stage directions. Yeah. So someone picks up a sword, someone dies. You go, well, what? He said, well, I don't do that. And, he said, <laughs> and that's what he said. And so I wrote all the mise en scène, and he wrote the script. That's so cool. <laughs> you got to collaborate with Harold Pinter, and you haven't made this. So it's, it's, it's King Lear, but it's. Do it's, you know it's why I haven't? King I'll tell you Lear. why I haven't made No, it's not. It's it is Shakespearean. 11th century. Oh, wow. Okay. I, first of all, I wanted to shoot it in Afghanistan, was the first place. That became a bit tricky. George W. Bush screwed that up for He him. really actually did kind of screw, my, screw up my schedule. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then I went, and then Tibet got dodgy. But I wanted the, the it's, you know, colonialism empire, right? English and the French. Um, and so, uh, but all, all of that happened. But I started to cast it. I started to talk to people. And, okay, so this is what happened. I had, this is the cast that I had. Do you want to hear it? Yeah. Maybe I shouldn't say. Please right. do. You know what, I will. Okay, my choice for King Lear was Christopher Walken. Right? Yeah. Fuck yeah. So cool. And his opening shot that I did for him is just phenomenal, right? <laughs> and, then, and then I had the kids. And I had want, wanting to do it, if I could get it. I had Emma Thompson, Kate Winslet, and Kate Blanchett. And Christopher Walken? And Christopher Walken. So I come to Hollywood, right? I'm, I mean, I start going around sort of trying to raise the money. And with that cast, with other m cast members, phenomenal as well. And they said, there's no money in Shakespeare, Tim. And that was it. Unless you're brown out, you're, you're out the window. And so I tried for a minute, and then I put it away. So now I'm going to come back to it. Wow, I can't wait. I hope you get it done. <laughs> I love those. No money in Shakespeare, Tim. I hope Walken, I don't know if Walken can still do it, but that would be incredible if the he can. The problem with it, when we started to board it, started to sort of schedule with it, is that this, it's everything. It, you know, and you, you can't really shoot him out. You can't, whoever plays him, you know, you can't, you've got to be up and running. So it might be, you know, I don't know. He gave, I met with him, I came out here and met with him. He was just phenomenal. He's about, he's actually, he's cool. That's yeah. exactly what he is. Well, you can tell that he's cool. I don't care about other kind of famous actors, but that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've got a, I've got a couple of those. Okay. You're kind of one what of them. What about the gold watch Britain speech? And, what? Gold watch speech. Oh, the gold watch, yeah. The gold watch speech is unbelievable. What? Yeah. Think, where does that come from? Up his ass. <laughs> the Quentin wrote that. Yeah. Your father held this watch. Up his ass. <laughs> That's a great speech. It's, it's the best. genius. Yeah. I love shit like that. Who was, uh, up until the war zone, who was, who, what director do you think influenced you the most going into making that movie? Alan Clark. Alan Clark. Alan Clark, yeah. yeah. yeah but, but I think that just purely is because of, uh, he 
gave me my, what I wanted to do, which was, I didn't want to be a, a theatre actor, I wanted to be in, on the telly. And he gave me the opportunity to, to do that, you know, and then, and then he kept trying to get me work, kept um, helping me. He was one of those people. So him, Ken Loach, is another one. But I wanted to do, um, with The War Zone, I wanted to do, take a subject that would normally be treated in, that, in, a, in a very kind of documentary style thing and do the opposite. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to bring David Lean to a subject of such sadness in a way. So I wanted to put the two together. You bring it to the landscapes, I think, the, the David Lean element. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know, Alan Clark is the director of uh, the first film that he was ever in. It's called Made in Britain. He plays a young neo-Nazi. <laughs> Which is kind of appropriate now. Uh, I, I would, and I also say was still one of the, one of the great opening shots of, of any movie, opening scene. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I love that song, UK82, and that shot. And, that was the exploited. You know. Oh, yeah, exactly, the exploited. It was, yeah, yeah they did that. Don't the invite music. leniency, do you? Uh, it's that great line. Yeah, it's fantastic. David Leland, man. Uh, before we, I move to questions, I forgot there's another project uh, that you're here to talk about that we haven't uh, talked about, which is Rillington Place, oh, which yeah. is coming to Sundance, where you play a serial killer. Charming chap. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> he's an interesting fella. They all are. Uh, yeah, he, he, he was a very, very, very famous case. His name is Christy, and he was the reason why the death penalty was abolished in, in England. He was actually one of the last people to be hanged, I think. And he, he killed women and a baby. Um, he was, it was he enjoyed to doing. He was a, but he was a very mild mannered, quiet, gentle old fella. He lived in a very kind of poor part of London, but he had a hobby and the, the woman, there was a woman and a guy and a baby uh, are upstairs and they, tell me if I'm rambling, no. but they, they moved in, he was living downstairs and he, uh, he killed the woman and the, and the kid. But then he convinced the husband that, that to go on the run, you know, to, that they're going to think you did it, that something, you know, to, you know. And then when the husband was pulled in and questioned by the police, my guy became the prosecution witness and framed him, set him up and got him hanged. So that was used, that case was used in England as a, an example of innocence can get you killed. You know, you, you, you know if, if it happens once, once is enough, we're done. Doesn't, it doesn't happen over here. Yeah, but, I was say good for the UK. Right, we, yeah. we, did, we did one thing, right? I mean, you know. Yeah, only one. Um, but but uh, anyway, so that's what this, this guy was part of that story. And you see an elements of that within, within the piece. But he was really creepy to play. It was a lot of fun. And Samantha Morton plays uh, your wife in it, yeah, right? She's, she's, she's amazing. Yeah, yeah, she's incredible. Yeah. And I kind of have to say that I, it was, that was why part of the reason I wanted to... Work with Smith. Yeah, and then we yeah. snagged the, the director of that and brought him over to Tin Star and did and had him do the episode. Episode we improvised. Oh, really? Yeah, it's amazing young uh, director. Yeah. Well, yep. Let's get some questions from the audience. Okay. Who has a question? All right. Um, so there seems to be a real blending of television and film these days. You've done network television, cable, streaming, and you've done films ranging from a Woody Allen musical to Michael Haneke doing a shot-by-shot -shot remake of his own film. So as an actor, do you see a difference between television and film? And what was it like working with those two directors I mentioned, who are two of my favorite that you haven't mentioned okay. yet? That's a lot in that one. <laughs> um, all right. Well, hang on a minute. You'll remind me. Um, I think, I'll tell you where I, where I think it all changed. First of all, I come from television in England, and there, but there was never a barrier. There was never a, 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 there was no snobbery and no barrier between stage and um, television and film. That, that was the case here. That absolutely was. You could, you could struggle, and, uh, uh, you could make it from TV and into film, but rarely did you bounce back and forth. David Simon changed all of that with The Wire. Everything changed. It was a, that was a game changer. I like that you go for The Wire and everybody else goes for The Sopranos. Nah. Good for I you. I mean, Steve, best, one of the best actors about, Steve Buscemi, but yeah. um, no, I would say The Wire because it was astounding um, 
writing and it was sweeping. Yeah. Just when you thought, just when you got comfortable, he changed the game. He did it, and so you, it was like it, it, it was like watching a great film. And so, and so everyone just wanted to be in that movie. And so it started to break down that barrier. And, and people started to sort of look at, oh, maybe, you know. Meanwhile, I was over on Lie to Me going, this is weird. Um, but we nabbed all of the actors from The Wire. We just, they just kept coming through because we would improvise on, on Lie to Me and they felt comfortable, so we would play. But we were watching. And Michael, like Michael B and all those guys, right? Um, that was the beginning. There were a couple of people that I spoke to who called me up and said, what's it like doing telly? And I said, it's hard. You know, I mean, you've got to deliver. Um, but it started, it definitely was happening. It was all, everyone was just sort of, the walls were coming, becoming thinner. People were having a go at it, you know, giving it. Now it's everyone. All, all bets are off. But that, there was a history of that in England, I guess what I'm saying, but, but, but didn't exist here. And now, go for it. I mean, anything, anything's on. Woody Allen, right? Woody Allen and Michael? Michael uh, Haneke. Yeah, Haneke. Okay. <laughs> so Woody Allen was like, sent me this letter. Would you be in my film? Yes. So then he said, he said I'm going to send you the whole script. I thought, all right. And then he said, no, I'm not. I'm going to send you just some your scenes. I was like, okay. So you learn them, and then you show up on the set, and he goes, he takes the script away from him, he says, okay, that's a good line, that's gonna get you a laugh. That's definitely a good one. This is all crap, all crap, all crap, all crap. Do whatever you do, but get to that one. That one's good too, that'll serve you well. <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> and so, so and there I am, doing a really do dodgy New York accent, right? Dodgy, because you won't have a dialect coach on set, thank you very much. <laughs> And having to improvise Woody Allen, which is kind of weird. Mm -hmm. Give him as the great writer. He's, he was so loose with me. I mean, other people, want, he does, I've heard he doesn't even talk to them or, you know, he expects you to just do your shit, you know, turn up, learn your lines, say your stuff and on you go. I thought that was kind of what was coming, but he was fine with me. He was kind of funny, I thought. But, you, you know, I, if you hang around behind the camera, with, with Woody, that's where you see the, the guy. Because that's, those are his mates and he's f comfortable with them. Michael, I turned it down, Michael Haneke. I turned it down because I just thought it was just too much for me when I read it. And, and then my agent said to me, look at the first one. And I looked at it and went, oh God, okay, I, should, I have to do this, you know. It, it, it's complicated. <laughs> The hard, I, it, he shot it in sequence. Michael is the most delicate, lovely human being. But I've never been so upset while I was making a film because you start your day, you get stressed, and then that's where you stop. And then you pick it up the next day and you just go, and you're going building and building. And it was upset. And the kid who's in it, I mean, I, without giving the game away, looks just like one of my boys. And I couldn't handle it. Couldn't hack it. <laughs> so I would do it again in a heartbeat, but I, I, it was a tough one. That was tough. But as a director, brilliant, you know. Yeah, he's Michael Haneke. <laughs> he, yeah, not bad. <laughs> uh, next question. Hi, Tim. Hi, um, so you played a villain in The Incredible Hulk. Um, I was oh, yeah. wondering what drew you to uh, be in a Marvel superhero movie, and is that something you would do again? Um, I did it for my boys. Oh, you kind of want to, you want to be in one of those. I'm going to be a monster. They can watch it with their mates. They can, you know, because they were, they were young. It's fun. You don't have to stand there. <laughs> Did they make you stand there? That's kind of cool. No, now you have to stand there. Stand there like that. That's really weird. Go sit down. Go sit down. No, stand there. <laughs> no, go sit down. No, keep going, keep going. Okay. That's what it's like being directed. Um, so, uh, I have a what were we you talking said, about? You, what did you ask me? Oh, the Hulk. Hulk. Doing, yeah. the, doing Hulk. I just thought, what fun. I mean, really, really, what a laugh. And I got to fly around in helicopters a bit. And then 
but we got to create the movement stuff in the studio and decide how the guy would move, you know, how he would change. And it's just fun. It's fun. You know, uh, you said that uh, one of the reasons you did it was for your kids. Now, apparently, you were also uh, asked to play Snape uh, on Harry Potter, the Alan Rickman's role, and you said that it, your your take on Snape would have been a little bit different. It, would be, it, was, it was different. I mean, we talked about it um, as as it should be. We're, we're different sure. different guys, you know. Um, yeah, I was reading them to my lads. That was the thing. And I thought, oh my God, when they, you know, what a fun idea. Because I was reading that character to my boys at bedtime. And then when it came to it, I, was, I wanted to play the monkey on Planet of the Apes. So I was like, I want to do a monkey. So, um, <laughs> who wouldn't, right? So I had both to do. And they, the Harry Potter people were brilliant. They were, were going to fly me back and forth make it all happen, but it just got overwhelming. And part of it, I suppose, in the end, I mean, in the end, they got the right guy, so it's fine. But is, do you wanna be, just be that? Because in the end, you, I mean, I, I wasn't quite ready. I wasn't ready to, just to exist as one version of myself. I wanted to be different things. Seven films as one character, kind of. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I. I wonder if I, I would have been any good at it. I mean, he certainly was. I don't think that I. I'm not sure if I would have been any good. Hmm. No, well, I'll never know. Yeah. But I, anyway, just thought it's a kind of interesting idea. I think I have time for one more question. Right, who's right here? Hey, Tim. Uh, over here. <laughs> Um, I was wondering, uh, since you got to play so many different roles, being able to transform into these characters, like I was wondering, like what what was the process behind the, uh, you know, getting into the mindset of uh, those roles that you've taken? Of of which ones? Um, I mean, anything in general, basically. Whether it's, it's all di the problem with that is that it's all kind of specific. So let's talk about the guy at Relinton Place. What was it like Relinton getting Place. Yeah, Relinton getting into his head? <laughs> Oh, legend, that was bloody hard, because he's such a sweetheart. That's hard, because that can be boring. And I can't play a piano. I haven't got a clue. Not even chopsticks. Not a clue. So I had 21 pieces of music I had to play, sections that I had to, to learn. Um, to be, to approximate, not to, not to be able to play them, but to approximate, and I had this fantastic piano teacher. He taught Gary on, as Beethoven, when they did the Beethoven movie. Gary Oldman. Um, anyway, he came and five months before we even started shooting, it started. And Ennio had sent the music, so we knew exactly what we were doing on that, on that, on that front. But I had, to, I had to try and fake it. We did everything on that film, I, I, I was, like, including that, with the arms coming through. We did, the, we did everything. Fake that crap out of that. Very, <laughs> but that's homework, so it's homework. Serial killer, autopsy reports, and things that aren't, haven't been published, and, and witness statements, and court statements, and so you get a sense of him. And then finding, I had to find, really difficult with him, had to find something good in him. And it was real hard to find. I don't think I, I don't think I succeeded. <laughs> but I, he was very popular on the street. They would invite him around for Christmas and stuff while his wife was away. You know, what, what but she most, wasn't away. What was she was most, under the floorboards? She was in the floorboards. Oh wow! <laughs> what was the most difficult role that you ever uh, that you ever had to do? For whatever reason, you know. Every uh, every bad film I've done. <laughs> Because it breaks your heart. <laughs> so you leave a little bit of your soul in the bucket. You see? <laughs> Every bad film I've done. Yeah. The, when it's a good one, even if it's exhausting and, and emotionally sort of a bit knackering, a bit sad or something, um, uh, it's okay. Because you feel like you're there for a reason and you're going to get to you guys and entertain the, you, hopefully, in a good way. But when you're doing it, when you leave your house to do something you don't want to do, like most people do in their life, um, it's pretty tough. Uh, I'm Tim spoiled brat, by the way. Spoiled brat. 
Uh, you're one of my favorite actors. I love when you come here. Tin Star is on Amazon, right? It's going to be on Amazon. And Rillington Place, I believe, is coming to the Sundance channel. Is there anything else uh, people should be looking out for right now? No, st I'm actually... No, I can't tell you what I'm doing, but I'm doing one of the films I'm doing. <laughs> Although I am doing one here, okay. which I'm looking forward to. And if you haven't seen his first film, Made in Britain, it is a classic, and everybody should really see it. Uh, Tim Roth, everybody. Thank Thanks, you so guys. much. Thank you.